Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of 2001, A Space Odyssey by Arthur C. Clarke. So I'm currently at the time of uh, filming, I'm on page 152 of about 266. So this will be a little bit mini reading vloggy as I kind of progress through the book. I should say I've never seen the movie as well, so I'm going to watch the movie after I've read this. Um, but in the meantime, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you the blurb, I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts on racing at the end. So, Dane reads... On the moon, an enigma is uncovered. So great are the implications of the discovery that, for the first time, men are sent out deep into the solar system. But before they can reach their destination, things begin to go wrong. Horribly wrong. Written when landing on the moon was still a dream, made into one of the most influential films of our century, brilliant, compulsive, prophetic, 2001 A Space Odyssey tackles the enduring theme of man's place in the universe. Now reissued with a new introduction by the author which tells the story of how 2001 took shape, plus two earlier short stories, The Sentinel and Encounter in the Dawn, from which this extraordinary novel was to grow. So, we're going to start here. Uh, what have we got here? Um, oh yeah, so it says, based on the screenplay by Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick. I didn't realise that the movie came first, although it kind of didn't. This is actually covered in the introduction and the foreword and all of that. Uh, Clarke kind of wrote them both at the same time. And this was interesting to me in the foreword. Behind every man now alive stands 30 ghosts, for that is the ratio by which the dead outnumber the living. Since the dawn of time, roughly 100 billion human beings have walked the planet Earth. Now this is an interesting number, for by a curious coincidence there are approximately 100 billion stars in our local universe, the Milky Way. So for every man who has ever lived in this universe there shines a star. Obviously those numbers have changed somewhat now. I mean 30 to 1 with uh, 100 billion beings um, means what? About 3 million, just over 3 million human beings were alive at that point. We're now at 8 billion. This is a very Arthur C. Clarke thing. Uh, he says, My work on men and space progress very smoothly because whenever one of Time Life's zealous researchers asks me, what is your authority for this statement? I would fix it with a basilisk stare and answer, you're looking at him. Uh, so he says, uh, The Sentinel was written in an explosion of energy at Christmas 1948 as my entry for a BBC short story competition. It wasn't even placed and I sometimes wondered what won. Um... He says, 2001 is often said to be based on the Sentinel, but that is a gross oversimplification. The two bear much the same relationship as an acorn and an oak tree. It needed a lot more material to make the movie, and some of it came from Encounter in the Dawn, aka Expedition to Earth, and four other short stories. But most of it was wholly new, and the result of months of brainstorming was Stanley, followed by lonely, well fairly lonely, rooms in... I was in room 1008 of the famous Hotel Chelsea at 222 West 23rd Street. That is the Chelsea Hotel of the Leonard Cohen song. Um, and he says, um, Why write a novel, you may well ask, when we were aiming to make a movie. It's true that novelizations uh, are all too often produced afterwards. In this case, Stanley had excellent reasons for reversing the process. Because a screenplay has to specify everything in excruciating detail, it is almost as tedious to read as to write. John Fowles put it very well when he said, Writing a novel is like swimming through the sea. Writing a film script is like thrashing through treacle. And so, is this based on the screenplay or not? Because the start said it was, but it kind of wasn't. Um, and he says, this is more or less the way it worked out though, towards the end novel and screenplay were being written simultaneously with feedback in both directions. Thus I rewrote some sections after seeing the movie Rushes, a rather expensive method of literary creation which few other authors can have enjoyed. Although I'm not sure if enjoyed is the right word. And I love this little note from his journal. Uh, 28th of November, phoned Isaac Asimov to discuss the biochemistry of turning vegetarians into carnivores. And uh, as an Isaac Asimov fan, more than an Arthur C. Clarke fan, I found that very interesting. And uh, this was just some interesting behind the scenes stuff. Throughout 1965, Stanley was involved in the incredibly complex post-production activities, made even more difficult by the fact that the film would be shot in England while he was still in New York, and under no circumstances would he travel by air. I am in no position to criticise, Stanley learned not to fly the hard way while getting his pilot's licence. For similar reasons, I have never been behind a steering wheel since the day I barely passed my driving test in Sydney, Australia in 1956. I too was cured for life by the traumatic experience. Um, I haven't been behind the wheel of a car since I passed my driving test. Uh, test either. I do want to get one at some point now. And so to begin with we almost have like, uh, we're moving on to the novel now, and we almost have like historical fiction because it starts way back in prehistory and we get this character. At the great age of 25 he was still in full possession of all his faculties. If his luck continued and he avoided accidents, disease, predators and starvation, he might survive for as much as another 10 years. That hit home hard because I have death anxiety and I'm about to turn 34. And uh, this was interesting because um, we still are very much struggling with overpopulation. 
Uh, as long as he could remember, it had not been a situation so much as a permanent crisis. Since the 1970s, the world had been dominated by two problems which, ironically, tended to cancel each other out. Though birth control was cheap, reliable and endorsed by all the main religions, it had come too late. The population of the world was now 6 billion, a third of them in the Chinese Empire. Laws had even been passed in some authoritarian societies limiting families to two children, but their enforcement had proved impractical. As a result, food was short in every country. Even the United States had meatless days, and widespread famine was predicted within 15 years, despite heroic efforts to farm the sea and develop synthetic foods. Well, obviously, we're now at 8 billion. Um, a third of them aren't in the Chinese Empire, but that's because they did have a law passed uh, limiting families to one child children, I think. Um, and yeah, widespread famine's probably coming. Uh, heroic efforts to farm the sea while we're predicted fishless oceans by 2048. Um, and meat production is the main cause. We have enough to feed everybody on the planet many times over. It's just we feed most of that food to uh, factory farmed animals. And he's getting in, uh, Floyd is getting in, sent into space and it says uh, uh, this trip he calculated would cost the taxpayers slightly over a million dollars. That is a tre cheap old trip to space. And there's, uh, someone says, is it really true about an epidemic on the moon? Because that's kind of why he's going there. And Floyd says, if it is, there's no cause for alarm. Remember there was a quarantine back in 98 over that mutated flu virus. A lot of people were sick, but no one died. It's kind of prescient of COVID-19. And we get a reference to the Turing test, which is an Alan Turing fan I thought was cool. Uh, whether Hal could actually think was a question which had been settled by the British mathematician Alan Turing back in the 1940s. Turing had pointed out that if one could carry out a prolonged conversation with the machine, whether by typewriter or microphone was immaterial, without being able to distinguish between its replies and those that a man might give, then the machine was thinking by any sensible definition of the world. Hal could pass the Turing test with ease. And Hal, uh, as we all know, he goes a bit doolally, the computer does. And I thought this was funny, like, for the purposes of morale. Uh, for relaxation, he could always engage Hal in a large number of semi-mathematical games, including checkers, chess, and pantominoes. If Hal went all out, he could win any one of them, but that would be bad for morale. So he'd been programmed to win only 50% of the time, and his human partners pretended not to know this. And they end up so far away from Earth, uh, even travelling at the speed of light, their signals were taking 50 minutes for the journey. Uh, though the whole world was looking over their shoulders, watching through their eyes and their instruments as Jupiter approached, it would be almost an hour before the news of their discoveries reached home. And as you can imagine, that makes communication very difficult. We get a reference to um, uh, the discovery using like um, gravitational pull of Jupiter, uh, like a ball on a cosmic pool table. And that reminded me of Red Dwarf because there's an episode in that when they actually do play pool with planets. Uh, Red Dwarf being one of my favorite TV shows. And uh, we got this also fascinating. One day somebody had predicted Earth would have a ring like Saturn's composed entirely of lost bolts, fasteners, and even tools that had escaped from careless orbital construction workers. Humans, man, we, we just litter everywhere. Alrighty, well I didn't actually tab anything else out in 2001 A Space Odyssey, but overall I did enjoy it. I gave it a week four out of five. To be honest, it did just feel like a slightly longer version of a sort of typical science fiction short story, and I've read a lot of them by this point. It wasn't quite as groundbreaking as I was expecting it to be, but it was certainly very interesting. It got crazy towards the end. The ending and the beginning are very different, and then, to be honest, it was the middle part that I enjoyed the most. Also, how the computer wasn't in it as much as I was expecting it to be. Um, I still plan to go and watch the movie as well, but yes, it was cool. So there we have it, that's what I made of 2001 A Space Odyssey by Arthur C. Clarke. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bunch of video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.